Ah, ah, ah. Hey everyone, the Ethany and Tano here, the internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you're doing well, and it is time for the final installment of Decade List Week, where I'm going over the best and the worst music of the 2010s. In this video, my top 200 albums of the past 10 years. It's a lot of albums, but that's a long span of time to be talking about some music, and uh, there were a lot of great records that dropped over the past 10 years, even more that honestly did not make this list, but still, for everyone's sanity and convenience, especially mine, I am handling the bottom half of this list in a block. I will be taking the next quarter in sections, and then speaking more about each album individually in my top 50. Every record in this list is placed down below by name in the description box, so if you're curious about a name, a title, anything like that, it's down there. And so, with my 101st spot at the top, my 200th spot at the bottom, here is my bottom 100 records. Here it is, you can see it on screen. Come and buy, you see all the albums. Oh my god, those are da 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 yeah. Okay, so we are now entering the top 100 section. Let's, Let's go. go. Going from 100 to 91, we have Daft Punk with Random Access Memories, the legendary dance music duos, celebration of all of the sounds and musical styles that have influenced their stuff over the years. Bjork's Breakup oriented concept album, Volnacura, comes next. After that, it is Run the Jewels, taking a refreshing and an updated approach to hardcore hip-hop on Run the Jewels 2. Following that, Regina Spector brings some of the best piano-based singer-songwriter music of the decade on Remember Us to Life. FKA Twigs, LP1, awesome and forward-thinking and cutting-edge alternative R&B. That was certainly some of the best in that genre of this decade. Can't also forget the great production from Arca on this one. Crowd Years Past Matter, a wild, technical, and experimental black metal record. Radiohead, a moon-shaped pool, which really needs no introduction at this point. Crying Beyond the Fleeting Gales, a awesome mix of synth-pop, twee, guitar heroism. It's such a weird and wild mix of rock styles and pop styles that I've heard nowhere else this decade, and I'm dying to hear more from this band in the near future. At 92, the West Coast is alive and well on YG's Still Brazy, a narrative-heavy hip-hop album with tons of great hooks, good flows. Following that, it's Perfume Genius with Put Your Back Into It, a series of hushed, sobering and chilling piano songs. Going from 90 to 81, we have Purient with Frozen, Niagara Falls. Dominic approaches so many different sounds and styles on this very versatile but consistently grim and icy record. 89, it is Nicholas Jar with Space Is Only Noise, some amazing micro house jams and fusions on that one. Travis Scott, 88, Rodeo, the way Travis uh, kind of turned trap into an expression of progressive and psychedelic music with the beat switches, the changes, the uh, really wet and mind-altering production was something to behold in the past 10 years. Following that, it's Haru Numuri, Haru Toshura, an amazing mix of art pop, J-pop, rock, punk, hip-hop music. It's, it's really just like everything that you could imagine coming together onto this gem of a record from Japan. Next, MGMT with Little Dark Age, the duo explores slightly gothic synth pop and so much more on their best crop of songs yet. At 85, Destroyer brings Sophisti Pop to a new level on Kaput. Billy Woods, one of the most esoteric and shadowy rappers of the East Coast on History Will Absolve Me. That one's amazing. Sons of Kemet, one of the best jazz acts out of the UK right now, killing it on Your Queen is a Reptile. At 82, it's Billie Eilish with When We All Fall Asleep, Where Do We Go, a pop record that, in my opinion, is vastly, vastly, vastly underrated and appreciated among the music snobbier crowd. I mean, the production on this thing for a pop record sounds like nothing else in its field right now. And at 81, it is Wise Blood with what 
I think is one of the best Baroque pop records of the decade, Titanic Rising. Going from 80 to 71, starting with Otoboke Beaver, Itikoma Hits, one of the best punk bands out of Japan right now, and this record is blistering, explosive, and thrilling. 79, it is Dorian Electra, one of the most exciting new faces in pop to drop over the past 10 years too, with some wild and gender-bent approaches to electropop and bubblegum bass. Following that, it is Rosalia with Los Angeles, a fantastic neo-flamenco album featuring amazing, amazing, amazing vocal work. One of the best and most thoughtful singer-songwriters of this past decade, Alex Cameron, Miami Memory at 77, one of the best rappers in the UK right now, Little Sims at 76 with Grey Area. Perfume Genius, No Shape after that once more at 75, Five, Grave Baby's Crusher at 74, mind-blowingly loud goth rock record that I am still trying to wrap my head around. Next, Shushu plays the music of Twin Peaks on plays the music of Twin Peaks and their takes on key tracks from the legendary TV series soundtrack. Um, are something else. Legendary hip hop outfit, A Tribe Called Quest at 72 with We Got It From Here, Thank You For Your Service. These guys are sounding better than ever on this comeback record. It is an amazing note to go out on. And at 71, Janelle Monet creates a cool series of fusions and crossovers between the worlds of art pop and R&B on the Arc Android. Going from 70 to 61, the legendary electropop duo The Knife pull out all the stops on their swan song of an album shaking the habitual. Following that at 69, Liars go full throttle with dystopian post-punk electronics on mess. At 68, we have Scott Walker's final LP, Bish Bosh, which is easily one of the strangest things that you will hear not just this decade, but ever throughout the rest of your entire life. Next, it's Killer Mike with rap music, which honestly still sounds like an atomic bomb coming out of the South. Then it's King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard fusing elements of psych, garage, and punk on the seamless Nonagon Infinity. Next, we have the return of none other than D'Angelo with The Vanguard on Black Messiah, a totally left field and one-of-a-kind fusion of funk and R&B. Then it's one of the most beautiful and texturally gratifying ambient and drone records of the decade, a double album of sorts. We have Dream Loss and Alien Observer from Grouper. At 63, I was totally won over by the intricate and groovy rock instrumentals and impressive vocal guests on Battle's Gloss Drop. At 62, it's one of the best Plunder Phonics records of the decade, One of Tricks Point Never's Replica, and Algiers speak truth to power with their unique fusion of post-punk and soul on the underside of power. And now, going from 60 to 51, we have Kieran J. Callanan with Bravado, a record that, yes, has that big a meme attached to it. You, you know the one, the guy, he's singing in the mountain, that one. But if you listen to this entire record, it does show that Kieran uh, proves himself to be one of the most enigmatic and uh, genuinely, authentically strange songwriters out there, and, and very charismatic too. At 59, Jack White takes a big, fat, bold risk on his most experimental solo effort yet, Boarding House Reach, split a lot of his fan base uh, up with this one, but still, for me, it's a great record. Next, we have a unique combination of narrative and free jazz on the Montana Roberts record, Coin Coin Chapter 4. And with Sun Kill Moon's Common as Light and Love are Red Valleys of Blood, Mark Kozilek proves himself to be one of the most filterless singer-songwriters of all time. At number 56, we get one of the most bestial and forward-thinking black metal records of the decade with Altar of Plague's Teeth Glory and Andrew Jackson Jihad, Knife Man, the closest thing I think we will ever get to a folk punk rock opera. At 54, Kanye West, the life of Pablo. Kanye is truly at one of the most freakish points in his discography here. Then following that, Queens of the Stone Age, like Clockwork, easily one of the best rock albums of the decade. At 52, Noise Hop Trio Clipping comes through with their fantastic sub-pop debut. And at 51, with tons of ambition and lo-fi rock production, Will Toledo and company as Carsey Headrest explore how tumultuous one's teens and twenties can be on Teens of Denial. And so we are now going into our top 50 of the decade. Let's do it! Number 50, we have Death Grips with their ambitious double album, The Powers That Be, one half super jittery, insane instrumentals loaded with Bjork samples, the other half some of the most guitar intensive work they've ever done on Jenny Death. At number 49, it is Ghost with Meliora, a satanic, enjoyable, 
I, I, cultish metal record that is amazingly catchy and still sees the band's edge intact while writing some of their sharpest, smartest, and sweetest songs to date. At 48, it is Frank Ocean with Blonde, a record that at this point really needs no introduction or explanation. I think as far as its portrayal of mood and emotion, it is one of the most reflective of this current generation's vibe, I guess you could say. Number 47 goes to Caro Caro Benito's Benito Generation, an amazing mix of dance pop and electro pop and J-pop that is incredibly bouncy, sweet, and speaks to a certain naive youthfulness that uh, in a weird way I find a little comforting. With number 46, it is the amazing crossover of two kings in hip hop, Freddie Gibbs, Freddie Kane, with Madlib on Pin Yada. At 45, Beach House give us one of the boldest and most fantastic statements on dream pop of this decade with Teen Dream. At number 44, we have Nicholas Jar yet again, but under his Against All Logic alias 2012 to 2017, where he delivers a bunch of fantastic, flavorful, dark, and groovy house cuts. With number 43, we have what I feel is one of the greatest and most exciting new faces and alchemists in the pop realm, and that would be Clarence Clarity with No Now. At number 42, we have one of the best bands to ever do it out of Japan, Melt Banana with Fetch, a mind-blowing, blistering, and lightning-fast combination of punk rock and noise. And with 41, we have what is easily one of the most passionate and thrilling post-punk records of the decade from Ice Age plowing into the field of love. Number 40, we have one of the most crushing, heavy, and feral approaches to rock music from Dope Body on the record Natural History. At 39, we have Fortet, one of the most dynamic, subtle, beautiful expressions of Micro House in the 2010s. Number 38, Agaloc, Marrow of the Spirit, one of the best American black metal records of this decade, in my opinion. A passionate, beautiful, melodic, and inspiring combination of metal and folk aesthetics. And at 37, we have one of the grandest, most experimental, exciting, and underappreciated records in the black metal field, Liturgy with HAQQ. Number 36, Flying Lotus expands the possibilities of hip hop, of electronic music, of jazz on the amazing Cosmogramma. And on 35, power violence reaches a level of ferocity and volume <laughs> and just general aggression that it's never known before on Nail's Unsilent Death. 34 is one of the most stunningly beautiful records, pristine records to drop in the 2010s. That is Julia Holter's Have You In My Wilderness. And with 33, it's one of the most disturbing records in the Shoo Shoo discography, Girl With Basket of Fruit. On 32, Law Dispute pushes storytelling in Screamo to new heights on wildlife. And on 31, Shabazz Palaces explores new psychedelic and experimental realms in hip hop on Black Up. At number 30, JPEG Mafia, experimental hip hop warrior, drops veteran at 29. Big Crit gives Mississippi, or continues to give Mississippi, a voice with his stupendous double record, Forever is a Mighty Long Time. Ariel Pink hones his instrumental chops, his production chops, and his songwriting on Pom Pom. And at 27, Behemoth, with The Satanist, they literally make a black metal record that is so good, they had to have sold their souls to the devil to make it. At 26, we have one of the most eerily beautiful records in indie rock, and that is Women, with Public Strain. At number 25, it's not just some of the darkest music of the decade, but some of the darkest music imaginable on the Lingua Ignota record Caligula, exploring themes of abuse, as well as sounds from the worlds of classical and industrial music. This is easily one of the most unsettling records of the past 10 years. At number 24, it's Natalia Lafourcade with Musas Volume 2. You could easily put Volume 1 in this section as well, as both records are an amazing expression of of various shades of South American folk music. You can tell everyone just went into these songs with so much love and so much care and so much passion about how they sounded. It is just like my ears being kissed, just kissed by little baby 
angels. At 23, we have what is essentially the swan song of the legendary folktronic and sound collage duo The Books with The Way Out. With number 22, English singer-songwriter Richard Dawson gives us a series of folky and experimental meditations that are a quick glimpse into a very near future. What Dawson does on this record is explores a lot of very negative aspects and ills of modern society and tries to turn the clock forward on them ever so slightly and and just kind of exacerbating how bad things can get in the very near future in a very great way with a fantastic songwriting, wild guitar work. I love it, I love it, I love it. At 21 we have Brock Hampton's trio of Saturation Records, Saturation 1, Saturation 2, Saturation 3. The boy band's fusions of pop, rap, R&B, and everything in between caused quite a stir this decade and for good reason. Number 20 on our list, Tyler the Creator Igor, the polarizing singer, rapper, producer, reinvents himself into a new character, a new concept, a new sound, mutant pop soul. And with 19, we have legendary singer, songwriter, PJ, Harvey, Let England Shake with a very thoughtful meditation on country, on politics, on the way she identifies and I guess envisions herself as, as an English person and citizen, and how through that lens she observes some of the darker portions of England's past, present, and future. Number 18 sees one of the most heart-wrenching and sobering records of the decade. That is Mount Erie's A Crow Looked at Me. All I can really say about this one is that, Phil, I hope you're okay. Number 17, Sun Kill Moon, Benji, fantastic singer-songwriter record, with Mark Kozilek delivering to us a perfect balance of story and song as he waxes poetically on everyday life, aging, and death. Number 16 is Joanna Newsom with Have One On Me, a record whose beauty is just still, despite this thing being a decade in the past, unfolding to me to this day. It is just the densest, most gorgeous, and most voluptuous onion, musical onion, <laughs> I think you can give yourself uh, the treat of listening to. Number 15 is my most favorite release in the world of Latin music this decade. That is Onda Tropica, their self-titled LP. Track after track after track, over 40 musicians on this record, tons of different styles of Latin music, styles on styles, and then fused with other stuff like pop and reggae and rock. But it all works, it all works so well. It's so huge, it's so exciting, it's so ambitious, it's so massive, it's so inventive, it's so fun. It's so gargantuan and it's so goddamn underrated. Just not enough people listening to this, appreciating this, and loving it. Jeez. At number 14, it is a gargantuan triple LP of what, in my opinion, is the best jazz music of the decade, and that would be Kamasi Washington with the Epic, a record that truly and honestly lives up to its title. At number 13, we have The Gorillas with Plastic Beach. In my opinion, the most exciting concept guest list and production to land on any Gorillaz record, and this list is incredibly fortunate to have had it drop this decade. At number 12, we have David Bowie, Black Star, Rest in Peace. Unfortunately, this past decade, we lost a lot of great musical minds and artists. David Bowie, for me, was the one that maybe hit the hardest, was the most shocking, especially since his passing coincided with the release of his final album here, on which, narratively, he deeply explores concepts of his image, of his twilight years, of his death, and what is likely to be our perception of it. It's like listening to a dark, grim, but also hopeful broadcast from Bowie himself from Beyond the Grave. And at number 11, we have Father John Misty, Josh Tillman, Pure Comedy, a record that is a somewhat incomplete but still incredibly admirable, passionate, and soulful ode to our broken world and everyone in it. So here we are, top 10, top 10 records of the decade, in my humble opinion. In my humble opinion. <laughs> Let's start 10, Danny Brown, Atrocity Exhibition. Detroit rapper Danny Brown pushes the boundaries of darkness, suffering, and anguish. Easily the most insane palette of instrumentals nearly any rapper has rapped on this decade. Combine that with the songwriting, the hooks, the guests, 
the explosive and manic and absolutely insane vocal delivery that Danny is known for. This is absolutely a one-of-a-kind record that we are, we're not going to be stunned at this level for quite a long time. At number nine, we have a beautiful, ambient, experimental, and drone apocalypse with Tim Hecker, Virgins, the atmosphere and creative sound play that Tim employs on this record are so ah, indescribable. It's so bittersweet, it's so moving, it's so textured. I like how direct a lot of the music on this record is for an ambient, for an experimental release. The way all these tracks uh, flow into and reinforce each other. Mm. Easily one of the best drone records out there over the past 10 years. Easily. At number eight, we have Fleet Foxes with Helplessness Blues. Robin Pecknold and the gang give us one pristine and gorgeous, layered, luscious folk tune after another, while simultaneously exploring these deep, yearning, gigantic feelings of wanting to contribute, do good in the world, make something of yourself in the world, be a part of something greater. In that sense, it's almost like this record is a religious experience. It's like uh, answering a higher calling. At number seven, we have a team up for the ages, Kanye West, Kid Cudi, turn hip hop and everything else on its head with Kid See Ghosts. The passion and the explosivity of this record is just so bold, so huge, and so difficult to measure despite the fact that it comes in such a small and a short package. I cannot say enough good things about this little thing of a miniature album. Kanye West and Kid Cudi truly bring out the best in each other on this thing. Hopefully this is not the last time that we hear from both of them in this capacity. At number six, we have what I feel is one of the most exciting and forward-thinking pop records of the decade. The shape of pop to come, if you will allow me to say, Charlie XCX with Charlie, from the features, to the singing, to the songwriting and performances, to the production, everything on this record is top notch. Charlie boldly pushing forward in a genre that typically just rewards conformity. I have a feeling it's going to take a very, 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 very long time for anyone to really thank her for what she did on this LP. At number five, dance punk has never sounded better than on LCD sound systems this is happening. James Murphy and company really outdid themselves on this one. From weird, absurd, verbose bangers like Pow Pow to funny, snarky, self-aware commentaries on the band and music itself uh, like you wanted to hit, uh, to straightforward, silly, hard hitters such as Drunk Girls. This record is just one fantastic cut after the next and the way that James and the rest of the band incorporate their influences and other songs and ideas from other records, very obviously uh, pulling ideas out of their biggest inspirations and the way that they reinvent them on this record is uh, really inspiring. Plus the recording, the engineering, the production, every sound, every instrument sounds so goddamn good, so goddamn crisp. <laughs> this, this is one of the reasons that LCD Sound System remains to be uh, one, one of the best bands of all time. It, even if I wasn't crazy about their their latest record. Eh, what are you going to do? Next on this list at number four is one of the best comebacks of the 2010s, a band that I did not uh, foresee returning after they had put out what was essentially their last record in 2010, It's Daughters, with You Won't Get What You Want. Eight years later, the band returns with one of the most harrowing, one of the darkest and disturbing explorations of noise rock, dealing in all of these themes of mental and emotional disturbance, exploring all of these feelings of rage and self-destruction and paranoia. There are very few records that dropped this decade whose exploration of dark emotions panned out in a way that was so potent, so ugh, you could cut it with a knife that the hairs on the back of your neck would stand up. At number three, we have Death Grips with the Money Store. Death Grips essentially breathe new life into the style, the sound of industrial hip hop by forging their own path in the sound. The underground over the past 10 years has very much been focused on expanding the darker and more experimental sides of hip hop music. And I don't know if a, a group 
has done that as well as Death Grips did, especially on this LP, which gives us the one-of-a-kind vocals and lyricism of Ride, insane cutting-edge and inventive production, the bombacity, the unreasonable aggression, as well as the explorations of paranoia and our dystopian digital age are all reasons this record lands so high on this list. Not to mention that few albums landed at the level of popularity that this record did, while simultaneously opening up as many new sounds and possibilities as it did. At number two, we have Swans, To Be Kind. The legendary post and experimental rock band came through with a record that, in my opinion, is the sound of rock music's apocalypse. The sound of rock music crumbling down violently onto itself and exploding into a bright supernova. While I don't think this record is the end of rock music or the death of rock music, it's certainly going to be the last time we hear in the genre as we know it a band take the style and hammer it down hammer it out to the point where you can stretch it from one end of the galaxy to the other. Which leads me to my number one spot on this list, Kendrick Lamar to Pimp a Butterfly. I not only am enamored to this day with the instrumentals on this LP, its amazing and expansive musical palette of hip-hop, jazz, soul, funk, the dense layers, the big but appropriate list of guests, and what a narrative and concept, which is executed so frickin' well. Just the way each piece of the story from each track weaves together. I know many people and critics over the years have boiled the idea and theme of this album down to maybe one or two things, but all in all, I see this record as just like this huge idea of self-realization and actualization, trying to be the most down-to-earth, authentic, and moral person you can be while existing in a place, in a space, where you are surrounded with things and temptations that are trying to push you to be the opposite. For Kendrick Lamar, that is the music industry and everything that is connected to the music industry and fame at large, but you can take a lot of these same ideas and apply them to your own life experience as well, because just as Kendrick is on this record, all of us are given choices at various points of our life where we are either making the best decision, the healthiest decision, the smartest decision, the most moral decision, or we are making the bad choice, the negative choice, the choice that's either hurting us or hurting others. And while the idea of life being a series of choices and realizations and just trying to put yourself on a good path, the right path, the right path for you, that's nothing revolutionary in the grander scheme of things, but I think Kendrick with this record, with his songs, with his talent and abilities, breathes new life into these ideas in a way that uh, I think no other artist in music or outside of music over the past 10 years has. And I think I'm going to leave it at that with To Pimp a Butterfly at my number one here. Thank you so, 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 so much for watching not only this video, but the past 10 years of content. Yes. And I will catch you guys in the next review because I'm going to be reviewing forever. Transition. This is my list. Thank you. Over here next to my head is another video that you can check out and also shout out to Jeremy and Austin who came up with their own decade lists, which we will link in the description box too. And, uh, and yeah, I think, I think that's it. That is, that is it. Yeah. Anthony Fantano, music, decade, list, best, albums, again, forever.